In all ages, humankind has used craft and cunning to scam fellow humans for pennies and for millions. The World Encyclopedia of Con Artists and Confidence Games clearly depicts the myriad swindles used throughout the centuries and profiles the most outrageous, inventive, and conniving con artists. The Bible reports the swindler's presence among its most righteous subjects. Jacob, the younger son of Isaac, conned his own father through impersonation to gain the coveted inheritance of his brother. History records that Demosthenes was defrauded of his father's estate in Athens. In 1710, Great Britain was so heavily in debt that its government embraced a scheme to sell stock to private investors in a trading company that would exploit its territories in the South Seas and American colonies. Investors were promised untold riches from slave trading and gold mines that were yet to be discovered. At first, investors saw good dividends, but the South Sea Company, under the direction of John Blount, began to water its stock so that by 1720, investors by the tens of thousands were holding useless securities, and the South Sea bubble burst. A similar fraud was perpetrated by John Law, a banker from Scotland who became head of the Bank of Amsterdam. Law, who had a pronounced proclivity for schemes and scams, convinced the French government to appoint him director of the Company of the Indies. Law then began selling stock in this firm that was to develop the rich Mississippi Valley in the Louisiana Territory controlled by France. Law inflated the price of the stock to the point where it was virtually worthless. The Mississippi bubble burst in 1720 and Law fled France a pauper. In America, the concept of watering stock was brought to new and dazzling heights by such flamboyant con men as Daniel Drew, Big Jim Fisk, and Jay Gould. These high binders made fortunes overnight by obtaining control of small railroad lines and steamship companies, then inflating their worth and selling unlimited and useless stock in these firms, creating panic and financial calamities in the unregulated stock markets of their era. These early day stock manipulators were the forerunners of such con men as Lowell Burrell, who was called by the Security and Exchange Commission the most brilliant manipulator of corporations in modern times. Burrell acquired small down and out companies, inflated their value, then sold enormous blocks of stock while transferring real cash and assets to other firms he owned. Burrell then sold the gutted corporations before investors discovered their hollow holdings. The con man made sure that no paper trail led directly to him. While his executives were charged with fraud and some went to prison, Burrell was spending his looted fortunes in playboy fashion and gloating over his ability to bilk millions from suckers. Once, when leaving a New York nightclub with a blonde on each arm, Burrell was approached by a distinguished attorney who told him he had made substantial investments in one of his firms. That was a mistake, laughed Burrell. Nobody makes any money in any of my companies except me. Another super stock hustler was Patrick Henry Packy Lennon. During the 1920s, Lennon assembled a super boiler room gang that sold useless stock for enormous profits. One of his victims was industrialist Augustine Joseph Cunningham, whom Lennon built for more than $100,000 in 1929. So bold was Lennon that in 1951, he approached Cunningham once again. The industrialist did not remember the con man and was bilked a second time by Lennon in another fantastic scheme that cost Cunningham more than $400,000. In England, such flim-flammers as Jabez Balfour and Horatio William Bottomley used public confidences to gain enormous spoils. Balfour was elected to Parliament and in the 1880s began to promote the idea of providing better living quarters for the underpaid worker, a land and building development scheme that would reap his firm a fortune. Balfour did cause hotels and homes to be built, but he declared few dividends, pocketing most of the investment money he received. He then sold his firm's properties to other firms he established until the holdings were lost in a labyrinth of paperwork and ledgers. In the financial panic of 1892, investors demanded a return on their money, which the Belfar Group could not meet. The firm collapsed and more than 25,000 persons were ruined. Belfar fled to Argentina, 
When he returned to England in 1895, he was charged and convicted of fraud and sent to prison for 14 years. He wrote a book about his life that became a bestseller, earning the con men enough money with which to retire comfortably. William Bottomley started with a secretary, a small office, and a set of books and began forming companies. He then sold stock, promising huge returns. But Bottomley produced no product for the most part and, after siphoning off investment monies, collapsed the company. Bottomley squandered his millions on horses, villas, and lavish parties, spending more than schemes could produce and repeatedly declaring bankruptcy. Bottomley used his collapsing company formulas dozens of times and even defended himself in court against scores of lawsuits. Still, he managed to get himself elected to Parliament and began a publication, John Bull, that proved somewhat successful. Yet, as if afflicted with some incurable disease, he could not resist the temptation to engage in his elaborate swindles. Tens of thousands of hapless investors were conned by this humbug for 40 years until he was finally sent to prison. The confident swindles practiced by Balfour and Bottomley were simple Peter DePaul schemes. These scam artists established a company, sold stock in the company, then began another company to pay off the most pressing debts of the first while skimming huge profits for themselves. In America, this same Peter DePaul scam was never better executed than by William Franklin Miller and more than a decade later, a five-foot, two-inch Italian immigrant, Charles Ponzi. Miller worked as a brokerage clerk in New York when he began to finagle investors into giving him $10 each. Miller promised to return $1 a week for each 10 weeks, plus the original $10 at the end of this time. Miller kept his word, convincing his investors that he was acting on inside stock market tips. Word of this phenomenal return on investment quickly spread. Investors rushed to Miller, who simply used the money from each successive investment group to pay off the first group, pocketing considerable sums between payoffs. Dubbed 520% Miller because of the fabulous return on money he provided, Miller was soon overwhelmed with investors but newspapers got wind of the scheme and labeled Miller a fraud, causing his investors to demand their money all at once. Unable to pay, Miller fled to Canada with $2 million. He was later caught and sent to prison. Little Charlie Ponzi was well aware of Miller's scams and a decade later instituted the same kind of scheme in Boston, except that his operation was blatant. Ponzi opened his own bank and began paying off at fabulous interest rates. Again, it was Peter DePaul, but for a time, Ponzi lived with millionaires. He, too, was exposed, and a run on his bank collapsed it. Like Miller, Ponzi ended up in prison. European swindlers Ivar Kruger and Serge Stavisky used methods similar to Miller and Ponzi's, but their confidence games were played on colossal scales. Kruger was known as the Swedish Match King because he bought up every matchmaking firm in Sweden. Kruger's personal fortune was built on enormous loans from banks that accepted bonds he had forged as collateral. He not only bought up whole European industries, but began making loans to the governments of Spain and Poland, millions of dollars at inflated interest rates. Again, he provided these loans from other ones to pay still other nations, taking huge amounts to support his 125 subsidiaries. It was Miller and Ponzi's Peter to Paul swindle again, but on the grandest scale ever imagined. There would never be enough interest to defray the actual loans. In the early 1930s, the inevitable happened, and the worldwide depression set in. Kruger's huge loans were called, and he could not meet the demand. His empire crumbled. Kruger committed suicide. In France, Serge Stavisky, a notorious con man, began selling pawn shop securities using fake jewelry as collateral for loans and investments he received directly from the French government. He bribed officials with millions of francs to sanction the useless bonds he issued and sold for enormous sums, mostly to insurance companies. In 1934, Stavisky and his high government cohorts were exposed, and the top leaders of the French government found themselves directly accused of collusion with this con artist. Premier Chantemps was compelled to turn over the reins of the government to an opposition leader, but by then Stavisky was dead, a reported suicide, but he may have been executed for toppling the French government.
The huge stock and bank frauds later practiced in America by Michael Milken and Charles Keating Jr. had been practiced a century earlier by accomplished confidence swindler Charlie Gondorf and two centuries earlier by the legendary Lord Gordon Gordon. Confidence games, of course, have not been confined to the manipulation of stocks and bonds. Even the smallest con game, when professionally practiced, has netted fortunes. Canada Bill Jones was the first to play the con game of three-card Monty with great success on the Mississippi River boats in the 1830s. It was a simple scam, with the victims betting and always losing on their ability to guess the queen shuffled between two aces. During the 1849 gold rush, an inventive sharper named Reed Waddell made a fortune selling gold bricks that he claimed were made from chunks of gold dug out of the northwestern mountains. The bricks had simply been painted gold with a plug of authentic gold Waddell would dig out for suckers to examine before making the sale. In the 1890s, William Elmer Meade made a fortune out of a scam he called the Magic Wallet. Meade would position himself in a restaurant next to a wealthy victim and pretend to find a wallet loaded with cash at the same time as the sucker. The wallet would contain no documents to show ownership, and Meade would propose that he and the sucker would share the cash if the owner could not be found. He further insisted that the victim hold the wallet while the search for the owner was conducted, but that the victim put up good faith money. Once Meade had gotten the earnest money, of course, he simply switched wallets and vanished. Buck Boatwright was expert at the green goods game, as was the accomplished Victor the Count Lustig. In this scam, the victim was shown a marvelous invention, a box that supposedly contained stolen U.S. mint plates that could somehow duplicate authentic $10 bills fed into its slot. After several genuine bills were produced through a false bottom in the box, the naive victims were convinced to pay handsomely for this money machine, which, when taken home, failed to produce anything but blank paper. Lustig went far beyond the green goods game. He was a flamboyant character who successfully impersonated politicians and government officials. In Paris, he pretended to be a French official and secretly met with scrap dealers, telling them that the Eiffel Tower was about to topple and had to be torn down. He actually sold the tower to the highest bidder. So bold was Lustig that he sold the tower again a decade later for even more money to another gulled scrap dealer. There were confidence game czars such as Big Mike McDonald in Chicago and Lou Blonger of Denver who oversaw all the confidence games in those cities at the turn of the century. Joseph Yellow Kid Weil and Fred Deacon Buckminster learned their con games under McDonald's protective umbrella in Chicago. Weil lived to be 101 years old and practiced every known con game, gleaning an estimated $12 million before his death. He, along with his erstwhile sidekick Buckminster, practiced the big store or wire game, where a wealthy victim was brought into a fake bookie operation, believing that he would know the winner of a given horse race before the bookies did. Wilde would convince the mark that he had a direct line from Western Union and could get the details of an out-of-state race before it was wired to the bookies. After the bet was made, a fake police raid would interrupt operations before the sucker could collect. This was an expensive con game that often cost Wilde thousands to set up for one sting but the victim was invariably wealthy and his bet usually enormous, enough to pay for the entire operation. Female con artists have been equally adept in bilking via simple and elaborate schemes. The most successful at the Badger game were Sophie Lyon and Ellen Peck. They made an art of seducing and compromising wealthy married men who paid off rather than have their trysts exposed. The Puyon sisters, applied the same compromise con on a multitude of elderly New York males. Cassie Chadwick was perhaps the boldest female con artist at the turn of the century. Chadwick convinced a Cleveland banker that she was the illegitimate daughter of billionaire Andrew Carnegie. The banker advanced Chadwick hundreds of thousands of dollars on the strength of this conviction and blindly accepted promissory notes bearing Carnegie's signature which was forged. Chadwick was Cleveland's reigning society queen, living in a huge mansion and enjoying every luxury until her fantastic fraud was finally exposed and she was sent to prison. <laughs>
Year after year, all manner of con games have been used successfully to bilk millions, from mail, insurance, and inheritance schemes to spiritual con games and medical fraud in which every malady imaginable is claimed to be cured. It was Big MacDonald, not P.T. Barnum, as popularly believed, who stated, there's a sucker born every minute. As the World Encyclopedia of Con Artists and Con Games clearly demonstrates, Big Mike was right. Victims' insatiable greed is the con artist's greatest partner in their crime. Welcome to Zane Publishing's Catalog and Information, our most complete catalog of reference and education. Here you'll see descriptions of our popular CD-ROMs, including many titles developed.